Hello everybody and welcome to Dr. Pam's video clips and uh, first of all reminder next Monday Dr. Janice Stanger is going to be joining us for a discussion about the paleo diet for our member calls so if you want to participate in that uh, just call our office and then I want to remind everybody fall conference is coming soon and um, I had an opportunity just a few days ago to spend some time with Dr. Neil Barnard at a fundraiser in the Hamptons for PCRM he's one of our speakers and I'm always so amazed when I hear him talk about the vast array of things that he's involved with, um, both himself and with PCRM. There's so much to talk about. We probably should book him to talk for 10 hours, but we only have him for two. But, you know, it's a good reason to come to Columbus and hear what he has to say. He has a new book coming out next year on diet and Alzheimer's disease. So we'll get some sneak preview about that. He's going to talk about diet and diabetes and the program that PCRM's been doing in GEICO. And uh, we'll cover as much ground as possible. But he's so entertaining and he's such an amazing person that uh, um, and I never get tired of hearing from him and I always learn something new so you will see me in the front row taking notes along with all the rest of you that join us in Columbus for our fall conference so uh, anyway let's get into some news I want to talk about two things today and the first one is something near and dear to my heart it's exercise and uh, some of you who follow me know that I exercise every day I can I think it's important not only helps with weight control it's important for balance and coordination and healthy aging and the list goes on and on I use it for stress relief everybody in my office will tell you I'm a much nicer person when I exercise than when I don't and it goes on and on I have a gym and a yoga studio as part of the wellness forum because I want to make it easy for our members to exercise and of course I just like having those things around myself. Now, I've said all that because what I'm going to say next might surprise you a little bit, which is I don't think the solution for our obesity problem is as simple as just increasing physical activity. And there's an awful lot in the news these days about if we just got kids to move around more, they'd all be thinner and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But studies actually show otherwise, and I'll explain to you what I mean. But um, a recent study looked at the daily calorie burn for the Hazda tribe, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, in northern Tanzania. And researchers theorized that these hunter-gatherers would be engaged in lots more physical activity than the average person living in a westernized society. And uh, the researchers did find that these, these people did engage in slightly more physical activity because their lifestyles demanded it. But after controlling for body size and composition, their daily calorie burn was just about like ours. And uh, they concluded that um, the difference in their weight and body composition had to be based more on the foods that they ate, food intake, rather than calorie expenditure through exercise. And really, when you stop and think about it, it's almost impossible to exercise away the excess calories and fat in many people's diet. I mean, think about it for a minute. Running for six miles in an hour, which is a decent pace for people who aren't marathon runners, um, that'll burn about 600 calories. Uh, one fast food meal though can contain 900 calories and 60 grams of fat. So how much running can a person do in a given day? I mean then that's just one meal. So and how much running can a kid do in one day? And it's not unusual for a kid to consume you know a, a fast food meal that has 600 calories or seven or 800 calories and, and several dozen grams of fat. Even some of the so-called health foods are not much better. Uh, everybody's all excited about kale chips being in almost every grocery store in America these days, but read the label. Each serving contains um, over 140 calories and nine grams of fat. The package contains two and a half servings, so eat the whole package and you've consumed 23 grams of fat in a snack. Of course, that's why we came out with our own low-fat kale chips, just a reminder that that's a great product that we offer here. So the bottom line is our obesity problem is not going to go away until we, of course, get people physically active. It's in their best interest to do it. I gave you reasons why at the beginning of this little talk here. But the other thing is we, we have to address the food that people put in their mouth. When you eat a calorie dilute high fiber diet, it is just about impossible to overeat. I mean, a bowl of rice and beans has 14 grams of fiber and you're just not going to be able to eat four servings of it because you'll explode. So um, you're going to be much better off eating a diet like that in terms of weight control. Uh, and the researchers in the study, by the way, acknowledged that exercise was beneficial, but um, they just said, we cannot deal with this obesity issue through exercise alone. So from a champion of the exercise cause like me, it says something when I tell you that exercise is almost secondary to food for weight control.
Now, the other thing I want to talk about is, um, of course, I report on studies that uh, people hear about in the news because I think there's a lot of confusion associated with, with those studies, but I also think it's my job to report on studies that people are unlikely to see much about in the news, but influence their lives in some pretty significant ways. And that's the second study I want to talk about here. So we're going to talk about the sticky issue of conflicts of interest in setting practice guidelines. Um, you know, everybody talks about evidence-based medicine, and lots of people say publicly that they practice evidence-based medicine, but I don't see much evidence that there is any evidence-based medicine taking, on, you know, taking over the general practice uh, for the general population. And, and one of the reasons is the ridiculous influence that drug and device makers have over the legislative process, government agencies, practice groups, etc. So um, a study published in the Archives of Internal Medicine uh, shows that conflicts of interest are really common in determining practice guidelines for cardiologists. Now, I've written about this before. This is not the only study that has shown this result. But in 2001, the researchers looked at 17 of the most recently published guidelines from the American Heart Association. Conflicts of interest included honoraria paid to the individuals involved, company ownership or stock, serving on a company's board or speakers bureaus, and grants. 56% of the guideline authors reported at least one conflict of interest. This may be one of the reasons why a 2009 study showed that only 11% of the guidelines issued by the American Heart Association qualified for a Class A rating based on evidence used for recommending them. Some guidelines were far worse than others. For example, 27 of 34 episodes of device-based therapy for cardiac rhythm abnormalities and 15 out of 19 for early management of young adults with stroke were conflicted. So that's a pretty high percentage when you think about it. And um, you know, when we talk about the American Heart Association, uh, the studies aren't the, or the practice recommendations, I should say, are not the only places where there are issues. This is a group that says butterball deep fried turkey breast uh, is good for heart patients, has it on its approved list of foods, um, and says nothing about Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn and his spectacular work on their website. So the researchers mentioned that the conflicts of interest with the individual clinicians is not the only problem. Organizations like the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association take large amounts of money from drug and device makers and makes it almost impossible for the groups to be impartial. Now, why do I think this is so important for you to know about it? You know, everybody in the United States at some point in time is going to be a medical consumer. It's impossible to, vo to avoid. We get sick, we need antibiotics, we have minor surgeries, and, and, and it, I mean, at some point in time, your number's up, you're gonna have to visit a doctor. And so you have to be very careful because there, I would say most doctors out there are using practice guidelines from their practice groups, like the American College of Cardiology, from their associations, like the American Heart Association, and by the way, the cardiologists aren't the only ones. The endocrinologists and all the other specialty groups have their groups and organizations too. And so um, it really is incumbent upon the patient to get their own information and ask the right questions so that you can evaluate the information that you're being told. A lot of what's out there is just plain wrong. And uh, you can't just show up in a doctor's office and do what you're told anymore. You need to take responsibility. So knowing that these kinds of conflicts of interest exist makes you feel empowered, at least that's my goal, to question more carefully the things that you're being told so that um, uh, you don't get hurt by medical care. Because when medical care is administered properly, it's a wonderful thing. But when it's not, disastrous things can happen. So I'll stop there. These articles will be posted in the Health Briefs online library. Thank you so much for listening. And feel free to pass these on to anybody who you think might be interested.